Today I want to talk about sonship. Everybody say sonship. sonship. Now you may be a daughter, and I'm not talking about transgender. I'm talking about spiritually. Each one of us is a son of God. If you're in Christ, you are a son of God. The question is, how do you become a son of God? Is it, through, is it through hard work, effort, manipulation of your behavior, reward and, and, and uh, uh, punishment for your actions on the outside? Is it about the cosmetics you put on your face to look like a son? Or is it by receiving the free gift of what the son did for you that makes you a son? This is the Christian. This should be the answer in Christianity. And yet the answer in Christianity often looks like performance, coming under the law, do good to get good, avoid bad to avoid bad. It doesn't look like faith receiving God's grace. And yet that is the very thing that separates Christianity from any other religion in the world. Every religion relies on a set of principles, a set of laws, a list of karma or yin and yang or some good things and some bad things a balance of life and when you live by that list you will eke over from the bad side of the spectrum to the good side of the spectrum over time and you know what that system works a lot of the time religion in many ways is better than no religion and that's why societies, if you study history, you will see where there has just been absolute chaos. Out of that chaos will emerge some system, some basic principles to help people avoid bad and come to good. And the historians will go, you see how bad they were? Look how much better off they are because of this system. And everyone applauds and everyone goes, great, religion, great. Christianity is completely different. Christianity says, I want you to avoid the whole system of good and bad. Jesus, what's the greatest commandments? What's the pinnacle of the system? And Jesus says, I want you to love God and I want you to love your neighbor. He says, on this, any other system you try and implement, it'll be fulfilled just by this law. These are my laws, he says. And it separates what man is able to do with what God's able to do. Because when you come into a covenant relationship with your heavenly father, based on love, not the system, you'll overcompensate in that system every single day of the week in your sleep. And most Christians in history and on the planet today have got an element of the love of God. And then to that element of the love of God, they add back all of these basic elements or all of these basic principles to try and prove that they know God and that they're a son of God. And the whole point of sonship has got nothing to do with your performance. It's got everything to do with your DNA and that you're connected, not based on what you do, but based on who you are. Somebody say amen. amen. Sonship is not about what you do. Sonship is based about who you are and who you're connected to. And so that, that's why Esther's saying, don't look in the mirror. When you look heavenward and you see the Father, you call him the Father. Why? Because you're a son. And when you look at the Son, you see, hey, he made me just like him. And when you discover who you are, your actions and the fruit and all the things you do will catch up to who he made you to be. Amen. If you get it the wrong way around, this is what we established last week. If you get it the wrong way around, you think you come to the Father's table based on what you do. And you will always be in a debt mentality, trying to catch up, trying, to, trying for your performance to catch up with the performance of Jesus. And you never will. In fact, it's an insult to Jesus to think that. Now, when you come to the Father's table, you come based on the fact that you're a son and then he seats you at his table because he loves you, not because of what you do. And then from the table that you're seated at in grace and in favor and in perfect love, perfect love casts out fear, from that place, then there is an outworking of that relationship of good performance, 
Over time, it increases in performance. But your performance will never get you to God's table. Jesus' performance got you to the table. And we're going to read some scriptures today to confirm that and look at that deeper. But today, I just want to talk about sons. About sons. So let's bring up the first scripture there, John, Romans 8, verse 14. And we read this last week, so I just want to recap. Should we read it again together? For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. So let's go back to the previous slide. What is the bondage again to fear? We, we mentioned this briefly last week. Why is it that we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear? What is that? In the context of, this is Romans 8, in the context of Romans 7, Paul is laboring the idea that man under sin has flesh that is weak. And the flesh that's weak cannot perform the law perfectly. And so he says, whilst my flesh is, is weak, my spirit is willing. So in my mind, the law of God, the Mosaic law, comes to my mind and says, hey, you know right from wrong. You should fulfill right from wrong. And his mind responds going, yes, God, I really want to do the right thing here. And then his body, full of sin, under the bondage of sin, can't do what his mind tells him to do. And he ends Romans 7 with, what a wretched man I am. He sees that his situation is helpless by his own effort. Because whilst he really, 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 really wants to come out of the bondage of sin, he can't. He knows he can't. And if anybody knew he can't, it's Paul. You think you work hard. Just take your best day where you work the hardest. And let's compare that to the day, the average day Paul had. He was getting letters from Jewish leaders to go and kill Christians. And they would go and watch them being stoned. Stephen was stoned in front of him. This guy was of such renown. When they were stoning Stephen, because he was preaching the gospel, they were throwing their coats at Paul's feet. That's how hard this guy worked. This is how much his performance tried to match up to the law. He was so zealous. He says there was no one. Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, amongst my peers, I had no equal. He was a far ahead. Anybody else who was studying the scriptures and trying to live righteously. He says, as, uh, as to religious righteousness, I was perfect. I was zealous for the law. And so when Romans 7 comes along, he is struggling through what it was like not being a son of God. And he's saying, the law, the Mosaic law, came to my mind. I recognized it. I recognized right and wrong. I agreed with it, but I couldn't perform it because I was under sin. Now, some people read Romans 7 and say, that's for the Christian. You see, the Christian has a sin nature, and a Christian has to struggle and war against their flesh. That's not what Paul was saying in Romans 7. He was saying before he was saved, he was a wretched man who recognized the law, but couldn't perform it. And then he says, who will save me? And then he says, thank God for Jesus. And then Romans 8 begins. Now, meaning there was a before, Romans 7. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. What that means is there is condemnation for those outside of Christ Jesus. Because those outside of Christ Jesus might recognize the law, they might recognize their behavior, and they will recognize how wretched they are. But once you come to Christ, there is no more condemnation. And once you come to Christ, you're made a son, and you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. What's the fear? The fear of not performing the law perfectly. Somebody say amen. I can hear it's going very quiet. 
either because you know it all already and I'm uh, elaborating too much, or because it sounds strange. Either way, go and read Romans 7 and 8. You will see that Paul has the sequence out of a legalist's mindset to solve the sin problem and into the freedom of a son that allows Jesus to solve the problem on his behalf. And so that's why he doesn't receive the spirit to make him a slave again to, to fear. But he received a spirit of adoption. What's that adoption? That adoption where he was an enemy of God. He was not a son of God. But he was brought into the family of God. And then the spirit agrees with his spirit. For as many are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. The, the spirit then agrees with his spirit. Abba, Father, you're my dad. Amen. That's what takes you out of the... F it's not just any old fear. It's not fear of the boogeyman under your bed. It's not fear of the tax man. It's fear of being in a performance-driven mindset that you know you can't live up to. That's the fear that he's saying, God didn't make us a slave again to fear. Let's go to the next slide. A few verses later, and then it says, For the earth, for creation, is eagerly expecting the manifestation or the revealing of the sons of God. Who are the sons? The people who understand that we receive sonship. We don't earn sonship. The people who've come out of the fear and the bondage of a performance mindset, thinking, do we get to eat at daddy's table today or not? Have we received enough favor? Have I done enough to get a little bit of favor? I've got favor today, but you know, if I mess up tomorrow, if I sin tomorrow, if I don't confess, if I don't forgive, then maybe he will withdraw his favor from me. Bondage. It's bondage. And so now the Mosaic law comes back to your mind, which is true and right and holy. And so you go, oh, it's true and right and holy. This, the, the law is good. But the law becomes death to you because you can't perform the law. So there's a curse on the law. Or through the law. Because the law is the perfect righteous standard. So when you can't live up to it, you come under the curse. Amen? That is bondage. So we're released from the curse of the laws. Romans 7 verse 4 says, We died to the law so we could belong to another. You're released from the curse. So you could come into freedom. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. What freedom? Freedom to dance in church? That's how we use the scripture. No. No. Is freedom from the law. Okay. I'm really nailing that in. People are looking at me blankly. That's okay. Let me say this on this verse. There is no operation of the kingdom outside of sonship. God's creation, which was subjected to frustration through Adam's sin, through Adam's rebellion, through man not submitting to what God was able to do and going their own way. And so creation will only be subjected again, not because of God's magic will, but because God is revealing to the very man or men who rebelled against him, they're revealing that you're no longer a rebel when you come into Christ. And when you receive sonship, creation goes, I'm no longer subjected to that rebellion. It is only by sonship that the manifestation of God's kingdom is operated and revealed to the earth. So let me, let me say this. To recognize a problem in the earth is very easy. Look at somebody crying. You go, oh, there's a problem. You may not understand the problem. You may not know the why. You know, may, may not know the extent of the pain. But you go, oh, here's a problem. Agreed? The solution, whenever it comes from the realm of man, will always create a bigger problem. Maybe that person crying is manipulating. Maybe they're crocodile tears. Maybe the problem is too big for you to handle. Maybe it's more complex. And so when man comes in to solve the problem, he will create a bigger problem. Proverbs said picking up a, another man's problem is like picking up a dog by the ears. I've got a scar on my hand because my little dog, <laughs> he, 
he caused a fight when a little stupid little dog caused a fight with a much bigger dog. It was his fault. And the big dog started to bite him at the back of the neck. And if I didn't intervene, our dog would be dead. Which may be standing here today. I think maybe that's a good thing. So because I love my dog, what do I do? I pick up the dog by the ears. Because where else do you pick up a dog? Big dog. So, and I'm on my tippy toes. Now, I'm not a short guy. I'm on my tippy toes, and I'm picking up with all my strength by the ears. And on the way up to picking up this dog, he drops my dog. And my dog got clever and thought, oh, we're in a fight now. I wasn't in a fight. I was trying to get out of the conundrum. He drops my dog. My dog starts to bite the big dog's feet. And I'm like, Rufus, get away. I'm like, I'm trying to save you. And now he's trying to save me. And so, I, of course, I dropped this, this huge, big black dog. I dropped the dog. And as soon as he lands, because my dog's right under his feet, he bites him again. <laughs> and my dog is squealing and, and like big puncture marks, big teeth. And so what do I do again? I obey the pattern and I pick up the big dog again. Now the big dog knows what's going on. Yeah. He drops my little dog, turns around. And just one bite, whoop, just blood everywhere, fat coming out of my arm. People on the rooftops, because they can hear all the commotion, shout, hey, 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 wanting to call ambulances and all sorts. And I remember my dad would tell a similar story with a dog that he picked up by the ears. And in that moment, he had that revelation. Picking up another man's problem is like picking up a dog by the ears. <laughs> You're just inviting a dog bite. And I mimicked the same thing my dad did. When you answer the world's problems by the world, you will create a bigger problem. And often you will become the victim of that problem. You become part of the problem. Creation is not waiting for the revelation of the same old, same old man's problems. It's waiting for the revelation or the revealing of the sons of God. When we address problems, we must first see what our heavenly father is doing. And what he's like and what is his nature. Because unlike looking at the mirror, we start to see characteristics that he created in us. Because he created us as a new creation. And when we see those characteristics and that nature revealed in us, that becomes the solution to the world's problems. If you don't, you will walk out around like a Christian like me with scars on your hands. Saying, oh, I tried to deal with that once and it was just a big problem. Just a big problem. And now you are a walking, talking problem. You've got to come to the earth's issues as a son. Many social justice warriors in the West, particularly in America and the UK, are approaching things that they think are so important, like global warming and the economies and, and who's doing all these bad things, whoever they deem. Is bad and evil not to say that those things aren't bad and evil but from their perspective they see an issue and then they become a social justice warrior and they fight it in their own power and what does that do it makes them victims they get locked up they get run over <laughs> they waste five years when they should be getting edu educated to become a positive force in the community they try and rip apart the community and the community then hates them for it do you know what that is that is a manifestation of the orphan spirit the orphan spirit says there's not enough we're all going to die and i'm going to make drag you down with me so i'm going to stop traffic and i'm going to put paint on hundred year old paintings and i'm going to stop you enjoying your life why because they can't in their own mind they can't see a way forward so everyone must lose out. That's what the orphan does. The orphan selfishly hoards food, thinking there's not enough, there's not enough. Whilst other people are starving, they go, oh, well, I'm going to hoard food. You hear stories all the time of a beautiful family adopting an orphan, bring the orphan into the house. And at three o'clock in the morning, that orphan's in kitchen cupboards. And the kitchen cupboards are stocked full of food. And that family would let that kid eat as much as he or she wants. Hoarding food around. Violent, angry, protective. Trying to solve the problem of whatever their problem is by their own effort. So they think hoarding will solve it. And yet the father's going, hey, I filled the cupboard for you. I adopted you on purpose. By my own will, I brought you into my family. 
to bless you so you could eat as much as you want. Why are you hoarding? Why are you trying to solve the problem by your own effort? If you don't understand that you're a son, you will op operate out of an orphan spirit. And you may be dressed smart, and you may look nice on the outside, and you may even have a good job. You can still operate in an orphan spirit. Why? Because you're so bad? No, because you don't see how much the Father loves you. When you see how much the Father loves you, you come under the spirit of adoption. Can someone say amen? amen. We may look at that a lot more. I'm just trying to add, add, introduce the idea of sonship. So we're going to jump around on a few things. We may look at that in depth later on. But I want you to see that sonship is very important. Think about this. How many times did the Father God speak to the Son God, Jesus, in case you think I'm worshiping the Son, uh, the S-O-N. <laughs> How many times did the Father speak to the Son audibly and publicly in the Bible? Yeah. Twice. That's a good answer. Three times. Three times. Now, Jesus was always praying to the Father. Always. He said, I do nothing unless I first see the Father do it. And so there was constant communication, communication between the Son and the Father. But publicly and audibly and recorded in the Bible, we have three occasions. The first occasion is where Jesus said, I'm going to the cross. My time is coming. Uh, in fact, he didn't say my time is coming. He said, this hour is here and I'm coming to this hour. Jesus was not subject to the times. The times were subject to him. So the son decided to give up his life. The son decided when that would happen. He didn't allow the world to decide how it was going to happen. He decided it was going to happen. It was part of his plan and his father's plan. So the, the, the hour that Jesus is coming to says, Father, glorify your name. Voice comes from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it. Some people go, is that God? Is that an angel? Is it thunder? We, we don't know what's going on. There was such a strangeness to the voice of God. But Jesus knew exactly that voice. That's one of the occasions. The first occasion that the voice, the, Father came, the voice of the Father came from heaven to the Son was when he was baptized. And the Son goes down into the water. And as he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. And a voice comes from heaven and says, This is my Son whom I love and, I'm, and in whom I am well pleased. This is my son. He didn't say, this is your Messiah. This is your Lord. Legitimate titles. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Legitimate title. Great title. Hey, that would have been powerful. This is the king of kings. What did he say? This is my son. The second time or the other time. Third time. I'm doing a rob now. <laughs> The third time that the voice, the father spoke about the son was when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's three voices. There's Moses, there's Elijah, and there's Jesus. And the voice comes from heaven and says, this is my prophet. Listen to him. No. This is a, a greater manifestation of the building of the house of God than of Moses. This is a greater servant than Moses. No. No. He says, this is my son. Listen to him. And the other two voices or characters disappeared. When the father looked at Jesus, he did not see the king of kings, although that it was true. When the father looked at Jesus, he didn't see the line of the tribe of the Judah. He didn't see a teacher. He didn't see a prophet. What did he see? The father saw the son. And so when the father looked at the prophet, Elijah, and he looked at the, the, the house that he built in, in Israel, Moses, that's what uh, Hebrews 3 says. He says, Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house, but the son is over God's house. He did not look at those two things and go, that's what I'm proud of. That's what I want everyone to listen to, the prophet and, and the lawgiver. He said, this is my son. Listen to him. Unless you see the son, you will not see what the father is looking at. 
unless you see the Son, you will not see what the Father is looking at. Let's bring up Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. God is not limited by one way to speak. And so he used all of those ways to speak to Jews and even people outside of the Jews. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom has also made the universe. So Jesus was there at the beginning. There was nothing created that was not created through the Son. And so when earth went into a complete rebellion against the Father, it was only the Son that could rectify that problem. And so he had to speak to him. He tried prophets and he tried law givers and he tried other elements to speak to these rebellious people. But then he sent his Son to speak to his people. Let's bring up the next verse there. It says, let's look at the description of the Son now. This is why if you can't see the Son, you can't see anything of the Father. It says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. If you can't see the Son, you cannot see the being, the substance of who the Father is. If you ever make Christianity about Lord of Lords, before you make him about the son, you're missing out on the father's purpose. Because two out of three times, he said, this is my son. He said, it's the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. John 1 says, the logos, the word came in flesh. That is Jesus. There is no sustenance out of the sun. Operate by any other means. Nothing will be sustainable. You'll be able to put a little bit of makeup on for a little while and look like you're playing the game. But it's only seeing the sun and operating like a sun that things will be sustained. So after he had provided purification for, set, for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. There's a lot to say about that. We won't go through that today. If you do not, do not see the sun, you will not see the Father. You can look at the prophets. You can look at the various ways. You can look at Scripture. You can look at everything that God made available and rightly and justly, and it's wonderful. But if you do not see the Son, you will not see the Father. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In another place, He said, you sought the Scriptures. For me, and yet I am standing right in front of you. Here I am. I'm the son. I'm the one all the scriptures spoke about. They would not accept the son. And Jesus said, you won't accept the son because you've never really accepted the father. And he said, there's a judgment waiting for you. Or oh, the judgment from the devil. He says, no, no, no. The judgment is from Moses. Because Moses believed in me. And you won't even believe Moses when he talks about me. Moses on the mountain of transfiguration, seeing Jesus. Do you know what a pleasure that was? It says in Hebrews that Moses regarded the poverty with Christ of greater value than all the riches of Egypt. How did Moses see the sun? It was thousands of years later. It was because Moses went and saw the glory of God in the cleft of the rock. Same rock, I think. The same cave, I think, that Elijah saw the glory of God. And so over time and geography, both these powerful, powerful prophets saw the sun. And when the father sees that inter interchange, he says, guys, Moses was a great servant. Elijah was really powerful. But this is my son. This is my son. Listen to him. Moses gave it all up for the son. Moses gave it all up. And so many people are trying to go back to Moses. And Jesus said, here I am. You search, you're searching for me. Here I am. Moses found me. <laughs> 
Moses enter into the promised land, not the promised land of, e of Israel. He entered the promised land of seeing the sun. When Moses said, show me your glory, he wasn't talking about white light. He was talking about the sun. That's the glory. If you do not see the sun, there is no operation in the kingdom that you can manifest. You must see the sun. Every time you try and operate the kingdom, there will be a diminishing negative effect over your life that would just dwindle and make you work harder and sweat more and perform harder to produce less. When you see the sun, you come into the sustenance of his powerful word and you come into an increasing glory, 2 Corinthians 3. That is not produced by your effort, but produced by his effort. We will talk about more of that some more. I'm just introducing the, the concept. The, the earth creation is waiting for the manifestation or the revealing of the sons of God. As I've been studying for this message, I've just been so blessed looking at the sun. It's very hard to study Jesus without becoming emotional. Um, I've realized in my own life, you know, I look at the scriptures, I study that I love David, and I love looking at the contrast with Saul, and I love Genesis, the intricacies, I love the genealogies. Man, I love Paul's letters, just the, the, the truth that he brings out of the gospel. Br brilliant. But I've realized in studying the sun, I've missed out on some of the sun. And I'm going, God, I just want to look at more of Jesus, both in the scripture and personally. I encourage you to do the same. Look at the sun. Look at this. It's good to look at Moses. Good look at Elijah. Those are good characters, man. They're so wonderful. They're so powerful. But that's not what the father's looking at. He's looking at the sun. That's where all his glory is hidden, is in the sun. Okay, Matthew 16. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is in the north of Israel. And there's a lot of gossip about who he is. I want you to see the interaction between what just general people are trying to fit Jesus into and what the true revelation of who he is is. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. People don't know who Jesus is. They're trying to fit him in to the archetype of one of the great characters. And they're trying to say, okay, let's give him this title or this lordship or this position. And you know, a lot of those things would be appropriate. Islam calls Jesus a prophet, one of the great prophets. It's an insult. It's an insult to lower Jesus to the status of what we could give any other man. An insult. They replied, blah, blah, blah. He says, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, sure, Simon got this so right. <laughs> he was the risk taker. But you know what? If there's one piece of credit you can give Peter, it's this. It's this. He saw the son. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. I've always looked at this verse and focused on the Messiah. But I've always missed, you are the son of the living God. He didn't call him by a man's title. He called him referencing the father and the son. And then look at Jesus. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, son of Jonah. What a strange, I think it's the only time he calls him son of Jonah. He recognizes where he came from. He says, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood or the realm of man but by my Father in heaven. You can only recognize the Son by the Father helping you to recognize. And I tell you that you are Peter on this rock. I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There is no operation of the kingdom outside of recognizing the Son. 
And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Why is that degree of authority available? Not because of the prophet. Not because of the king of kings. Not because he's rabbi. But because he's the son. And when you operate as a son, you get such divine authority. Do you know that when God created the earth, he put everything in place. He put all the systems and he blessed them and he favored them. And he put all the biology and, and chemistry together. And he made animals and the oceans and sun. And he set everything in order. And once it was perfect, he said, so good. This is good. He created man whom he called very good. And then he put man in authority over creation. And it was that Adam operated as the boss of the planet, as God's son. The first created human on the planet, he gave the keys to the planet. And so I love it that Adam's responsibility was to name the animals, and they called them forth a little bit like uh, uh, um, Noah bringing the, uh, the animals into the ark. He called forth the animals and he gave them a name. Now, in Judaism, a name is more than just your title. It's also part of your nature. And so I like to think, I don't know if this is true, and I've heard this from several different people. When Adam named the animals, he wasn't just calling them zebra. He was also giving them some characteristics. You'll be fast and black and white. And you'll run in the plains and you'll go in this place. I like to think that Adam was part of the creative process. And you know that you and I, when we operate in our sonship and we receive the authority, we are authorized to author our destinies. We are authorized to author how the planet comes out from the frustration of that rebellion and into the freedom of the sons of God. See, when you're an orphan, you are a victim of your circumstance. You're a victim of poverty. You're a victim of lack. You're a victim of abuse. But when you come to be a son, you are empowered with the keys to open up the pantry. To say to the abuser, no. What will take you out of abuse quicker than any psychology and any self-help book and any prayer and any prophecy? What will take you out of abuse is seeing that you're a son and you go you can't treat me this way i am a son of the living god that's authority to author how your life you want your life to be an orphan will always be a victim always i've worked with orphans i've employed orphans and i mean physically mommy or daddy or both died and that psychology has played with them. And they'll come into my environment and I know who I am. And I know my relationship with other people. Which is generous and loving and kind and spacious. And I'll have an orphan come and work with me. And they will hoard and play little silo games. And uh, tell you this piece of information and tell that, piece, that person this piece of information. And play one against the other. And it's always difficult. It's never open. Why? Because they feel like they're victims. They feel afraid. They're not honest with you. They're not straight with you. If they make a mistake, you will never find it. You'll find the mess in three years' time. Why? Because they're orphans. You know what a son does? A son says, oh, man, I messed that up. Just tell everybody, oh, I messed that thing up. Why? Because their, their position is not based on their performance. They know they're accepted even with their mistakes. So when you come under sonship, that will stop you living in fear. It'll take you out of that bondage. People won't be able to bully you because you'll go, you, you're not allowed to bully me. I'm a son. Not arrogant, not my rights, my rights, my rights, but he gives me the right to not be abused. I'm a son. I, you know, our family always had food. We always had food on the table. My parents will tell you miracles that we, when we didn't have food, food would multiply. People would knock on the door and come and bring us food. 
absolutely miraculous some of the things. We saw miracles in our household growing up. But when I got to my late teens, I, I said, God, I want to have more than enough. I don't want to be just be rescued. And my parents will agree with me. This is not an insult at them. We lived a made up, such privileged lives, I can tell you that. But I said, God, I want to live in abundance. I want to see overflow. And so God took me through a process of learning how to access his abundance. And so today, I don't wait for the door knock to see if I can have a steak tonight or not. I just buy steak, obviously. <laughs> and as. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too prosperous, huh? God needs to cut up. Well, my point. My point isn't really about money. It's about, do I know how to access whatever it is God wants to empower me with or whatever I would, the desires he's placed in my heart, I want to manifest. I could stay in that position where I'm waiting for the door knock or I could go, Father, I see this by revelation. Teach me. The way that God taught me wasn't to make me a better servant. The way that God taught me for finance was how to become a better son. And when I say better son, I don't mean to perform better. I mean to receive more. And so as I lived out, people would come and knock on my door with $4 million deals. When we first started, I, we had no money. We were eating noodles and dumplings because we had no money. Two, minute, two dollar noodles or whatever they were, eight dollar noodles. We were, we were, we didn't have money. And I would get door knocks. Ah, oh, this is the miracle now. This is the miracle. And the, uh, the miracle would be $4 million someone wanted to invest with me. And God says, no, I don't want you to be a slave to that. Huh? But Father, isn't that the blessing? This, isn't, this is how we grew up. We had door knocks to bless us. No, nope, I'm teaching you how to be a son. There's another level available. Next door knock, half a million bucks. And you can keep all the business and I'll pay you a salary that's 10 times what you're earning now. Father, surely this is the miracle. No, Sean, that will make you a slave again. I don't want you to be a slave. I want you to be a son. And so uh, as God has led me, and I've followed very clumsily. Please don't think it's a success story. I've made more mistakes than, many more mistakes than, than good choices. But as God's led me, it's been a revelation, not a finance. It's been a revelation of sonhood. And so this is not a boast. I promise you this is not a boast. But the room that you're sitting in today is a result of that journey. It's not a result of me becoming a good steward. I'm all for being a good steward. This is a result of going, Father, I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to do this. But show me how to receive as a son. Sean, I'm going to bless you, my son. Bless you. I have friends who walk in here who have businesses, some very successful businesses, much more successful than anything I've ever done. And they'll come in and go, wow, this is so great. You can't find this in Saikung. This is unheard of. And in my mind, I go, you have no idea. It's got nothing to do with what I can do. It's just because he loves me and he blesses me. What's your secret, Sean? Oh, I can't tell you my secret because <laughs> I don't have one. I don't have the ability. But I do have a father who loves me. I know that's a weak analogy, but I, I want to impress on you. Do not approach problems. Do not approach your circumstance from a distant place from your heavenly father. Because you will always arrive at it thinking that you've got to solve the problem. You'll end up with scars. You'll end up with a performance mentality. You understand that you are ready at the table. And when you're at that table, he will br bring solutions through you, not based on what you do, but based on who you are and whose you are. Amen. Amen. I want to read one, I think, I think one last scripture. Let's bring up uh, Ephesians 2. And we're going to read it in the Passion. Just because it's unusual and it'll, it'll break the way that you usually read it, whether it's King James or NIV or whatever. Ephesians 1, at least in my interpretation, is all about what God does. It's all about who he is and his position. And Ephesians 2 begins with, and now as for you. And so now we're going to talk about our position and what we're conditioned with and uh, some of the fallout of uh, 
becoming a Christian. Some of the great, wonderful fallen. And so in the Passion it says, And His fullness fills you. The Spirit without measure will fill you. There's no way for the Spirit to fill you unless there's an overflow. Because He's so full, He's never ending. He will just keep on filling and filling and filling and filling and filling. And so it's a very sad thing when the orphan says, Oh, I've got enough for the winter. And they've got a little packet of food. A son realizes that God's just going to bless you and bless you and bless you. Sons are much more generous. Incredibly generous. Orphans are stingy and selfish. And we're not talking about, I know people who have beautiful parents and they're orphans. Because they've got an orphan mentality, an orphan heart. Something's been damaged. Some mindset is set in where they become orphaned. It's about a heavenly is your father alive? Is he living? Are you a living son? Or is God just Santa Claus up there with the big stick that beats you every now and again? We're not talking about earthly orphans. Some of the most powerful pe people on the planet are orphaned earthly, but they see that they've got a heavenly father. So all his fullness fills you, even though you were once like corpses, dead in your sins and offenses. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion, customs, and values of this world, obeying the dark ruler of the earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently <laughs> and works diligently in the heart of those who are disobedient to the truth of God. The corruption that was in us from birth was expressed through the deeds and desires of our self-life. We lived by whatever natural cravings and thoughts our minds dictated, living as rebellious children to God, subject to God's wrath like everybody else. Outside of Christ, there is a wrath of God. But God still loved us with such a great love. He is also rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. And he saved us by our, his wonderful grace. He saved us by his wonderful grace. You don't save you by your works. Every Christian believes that. Then they come into their salvation and they go, okay, now I've got to earn and deserve. Because he saved me, I've got to keep up this, this payment scheme. I've got to stay in bondage. No, no, no. He saved us by grace. We live by grace. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one. And we ascended with him into the, uh, the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. Say, I am one with Christ. That means whatever Christ has, I have. Now, Christians get very nervous about this. Because there are some weirdos out there who twist this a little bit. But if you're one with Christ, and you're seated on the same throne that Christ is seated on, you have the same authority. That Oh, this is very dodgy territory. You're saying you're like Jesus? Yes. I, I don't know another way to read this. Go and read it in the other versions. It says the same thing. You are like Christ. Now, people don't like that. But how can you be like God? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Not we're covered over with His righteousness. We have become His righteousness. We are not imitation copies we are one with Christ. Now, there's a great commentator called John Lightfoot. He said, we are like Christ, not by his nature, because he was created perfect. We are like Christ by his grace. He made us like him. So you are not like Jesus in the, in the sense that from the beginning of time, before time existed, you were like Christ. No, you have been made like Christ. So there is a distinction and a difference in that sense. So we've qualified but in terms of our righteousness and in terms of our authority, we are seated with Christ. We have the same authority. So that's why in Matthew 16, when Peter recognizes the son, he says, you will be given the keys. Whatever you bind in heaven will be bound. Uh, whatever you bind in earth will be bound on earth. 
So what he said, he said, the heaven and earth connection is equal. If you bind it here, it's bound there. If you bind it there, it's going to be bound here. Why? Because we're seated in heavenly realms with Christ. This is a strange, a strange idea. I do not understand it in the slightest. But I want to tell you, unless you see the Son's authority, you will not function in your authority. And if you think there's a distinction, then the next time you come to a cripple, you're going to go, I can't pray because I know if Jesus was here, he would pray and the cripple would get out of the wheelchair. But you're, I'm not Jesus, so I'm not going to pray. The next time your bank manager phones you and says, you need to pay your rent. You go, I know if Jesus was here, he would tell me to go fishing and I'd put a, a gold coin out of the fish's mouth. But I'm not Jesus. So I'm going to become a victim of this circumstance and say, lock me up, put me in prison. No, you need to go, I'm like Christ. Here's a situation that is under frustration. And I have the keys to change the situation as a son. Father, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. But I'm your son. I know you're going to help me. And then you are empowered to deal with the situation. Does that make sense? The reason why so many of us are victims is because we don't stand, stand up in the authority of us being sons. And the reason we don't stand up as in our authority is because either we see Jesus, but we say we're different. Or we don't see him at all. You need to see the Son, and then you need to see that you were created in His image. Legalists do not like that idea. They have to work very hard to separate it out and go, no, 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 no. No, you are created just like Jesus. You can say that with so much evidence from New Covenant Scripture because we died and we were raised again with Christ. We are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. We are co-seated as one with Christ. Throughout the coming ages, we will be, we will be, we will be the visible display of the infinite. God has blessed you to display his glory. This should impact us. We should look at this and go, well, I'm not this. The degree to which you haven't seen that he's the son and that he's made you in his image is the degree to which you won't display his glory. And then earth is left in frustration. The social justice warriors worrying about cl cl climate change. The way to deal with climate change is become a son and display his glory. Any problem, name a problem, sons can solve the problem. They are authorized to author a new destiny. Like Adam was authorized to call out of beings their nature. We are authorized to author a new destiny. It's different going to a slave and saying, hey, here's a problem. The slave has to go, uh, could you hold on one second? Let me go and speak to my boss. They go to the boss and say, okay, boss, here's what they said. Do you want blue or red? The boss says, I'm not sure. Um, maybe we should look at different options. Uh, the boss isn't sure. He'd look at different options. Well, have you thought about, okay, just hold on one second. Let me go and speak to my boss. Um, that's how some Christians treat the father in heaven. Father, what should I wear today? Should I do this or this? And so they've got the slave mentality, whereas a son goes, Oh, here's a problem. I know my father. I know what he would do. It's not that they don't have a relation and they don't talk about it's because they've got such a good relationship with their father and they're displaying his glory that they just step into the problem and they're authorized to solve the problem. And the more time you spend with your father, the more you know what he likes. And so you can produce solutions and solve the frustration on the planet as a son. Every time someone was sick came to Jesus, Jesus didn't turn around and say, hold on, let me just, Father in heaven, how would you deal with this? He says, I, I do nothing unless I see my father do. People just came up to him, power, just said this thing, reacted this way, got a whip out, kicked over tables. He did whatever his father would do. But he didn't turn around and ask for permission every time there was a decision to be made. He knew he already had the keys. He was so confident of the keys, he says, I'm not going to give my life over. I mean, you're not going to take my life. I'm going to give it over. And only when I give it over will it be taken. I can call down 12,000 angels, 12 legions or whatever it is. He, had, he knew he had the authority. He did not have to ask 
for the authority. He already had it. The moment he came out of the water, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. He, I have the authority. That love authorizes me. When I go home, even though I haven't lived at home for decades, I can go into my mom's fridge and pull out anything I want. Why? Because I'm her son. And your heavenly father has a fridge full of goodies. And most Christians will not open up the fridge because they're waiting to ask for permission to solve the problem. It is a slave. It is an orphan mindset. God has empowered you. He has blessed you. He has favored you. I'm not saying don't pray. I'm not saying don't ask. Not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about rebellion. I'm talking about not being paralyzed by your analysis of whether and shouldn't you and trying to find six scriptures and four words so that you can then start to move. I'm talking about saying, God, I know you favored me. Let me operate as a son and not as a slave. Amen. Failure is a good thing. Failure is a good thing. It's okay to fail. Every character in the Bible failed except for Jesus. Every single one. And some of the greatest redemption and grace and compassion came from those failures. If you are worried that if your failure stops the grace of God, then you haven't read the scripture and you have not seen the son. Step out. Give it a go. You are authorized from heaven to solve problems. Solve them. We're just introducing it. We're going to go into each of these things. I know I'm jumping around. We're going to go into each of these things deeper. But I want to give you a title so you can see that this is important. Um, limited riches of His grace and kindness, which were showered upon us in Christ Jesus. For it was only through this wonderful grace that we believed in Him. Nothing we did could ever earn this salvation. Can you see that? Nothing you did could earn the salvation. For it was a gracious gift from the God that brought us into Christ. No one will ever be able to boast. For salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. You could never earn or deserve it. That's what a slave thinks. Let me do better so my master will look at me favorably. No, a son knows he's favored anyway. That's why most often sons are naughties with dads. Because they know the dad loves them anyway. A little bit of naughtiness is good. Next verse. I want you to see the, the way to look at this now. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each one of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. A legalist will look at these good works and say, see, you need to do good works. No, no, no. The only reason you can do good works is because he has cre recreated you as his poetry. He's authored you so you can become an author. He has authorized you so you are authorized to actually play a part in creation. The author decides how the book goes. Not the publisher. Not the reader. The author decides. God has given you the keys to author his will and destiny on the earth. That's what creation is waiting for. The revealing of the sons of God. Now, do not get it mixed up and think that the good works you do earn you favor. No, the favor that you already have as a son, when he authorized you, allows you to do the good works. So that you can never boast and say, look how close I got to God by what I did. No, you boast in the son and his good works. And then you get to fulfill a journey of excitement and passion and failure because you're always accepted in the beloved. It's good to do good works. And we'll talk more about that, how God authorizes you and how God deals, it gives authority to a son to deal with issues. We'll talk about that. It's good, but never think that makes you a son. The sun makes you poetry so that you can do good works. Amen. Okay, I've got some more things. We'll, we'll leave that there. Let's shut that down, John. Everybody just stand and just lift your hands and say, Thank you, Father, for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for being the best son. <laughs> Thank you for being God's glory on the earth. 
And Jesus, let me just pray. <laughs> uh, and Jesus, I thank you that you said whatever the Father has will become yours. Whatever he has is yours. And then you said, whatever is mine, I will give to you. Thank you, Jesus, that we didn't have to earn and deserve the gifts and the favor. That you earned and deserved all the gifts and the favor on our behalf and then gave them to us by your grace. We thank you, Jesus, that when we sit on the throne in heaven, the angels can't really tell the difference between us and you. <laughs> they have to look twice. Like, oh, oh, that's not Jesus. <laughs> because we are clothed in your glory. We are clothed in your favor. Thank you, Jesus, that we do not walk around on the planet as mere men, as mere mortals. That we walk around on the planet as people beloved by the living God. That we walk around as sons and daughters. That we walk around authorized to release the earth from frustration. To solve problems. Empowered to look at things that are broken and perverted and call them into alignment with the way that you created things, Lord. Thank you for that power. Thank you for that authority. We thank you. And we thank you that that power and that authority does not make us worth your love, but that your son made us worth your love, that you so loved us, that you spilt and you placed us in heavenly realms. You spilt your blood to place us in those heavenly realms. And then from that place of love, you authorized us to do good works. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you presence yourself with us continuously. I just pray that every soul that you impress yourself on, Holy Spirit, becomes so hyper aware of the revelation that they are a son of God, that they are loved, that they are accepted, they are favored. This is my son. With whom I am well pleased. I love him. Thank you. Thank you that our spirits agree with the Holy Spirit and cry out, Abba, Father. Thank you for that love. Just pray over these, this week coming that people would have a heightened sense of that love and that adoption. Full inheritance rights. I just pray for encouragement for each one of you listening, whether it be online or in person. To open up the fridge, to dare to believe that God is going to bless you, that he's going to favor you. And be a little bit cheeky, little, be a little bit naughty and say, Father, I know you've blessed me. I know you've blessed me. You know, when I walk into my boss's office, I knock three times, I wait for an answer. I slowly open the door. I say, yes, sir, no, sir. Very respectful. But you know, when I walk into mommy and daddy's house, hi, I'm here. <laughs> You've been waiting for me. I just pray for a confidence, a bold confidence to approach the throne of grace. Some people are so afraid to approach the throne of grace because they think God's angry with them. Others won't approach because they go, I don't want to approach God because I don't want to just come to him because I need something. And yet the scripture says, boldly approach the throne of grace in our time of need. Never feel inadequate because you're inadequate. <laughs> you are inadequate, so approach and say, Father, help me. I need. And God will bless you and favor you. It's for his good pleasure that he gave. It's because he loves you that he gives. So never feel less because you receive. He wants to bless you. He wants to give more to you. He wants to empower you and manifest you as the living sons of God. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for that light. Thank you for that life. We thank you <laughs> to the degree that you've blessed us is beyond what we could think or imagine. And I don't even know how I can pray this th prayer with integrity, Father, but I, play, I pray for even more blessing and more favor. I pray for a greater man manifestation of the authority of the sons of God in this house. Thank you. I pray for that confidence, that confidence, that confidence. I feel God is saying to City Church that as we're in that zone of receiving, that he's saying, I, I, I'm not looking to just bless you with things, toys, 
and nice stuff. Although I want to give you all of that stuff too. I also want you to step up into the authority that I've given you. And so simultaneously, there is gift giving and there's gift giving. There's gift givings that make us feel nice and feel good. But there's also gift giving that is empowering and authoring, uh, authorizing us to step up into the Father's business. Because the Father is in the business of realigning things that were perverted and broken with first Adam. And so he is authorizing each of us to take on what Jesus took on. Because Jesus said, you know, you're going to do the works that I did and even greater works. The works that Jesus did was undoing what the enemy had done through the rebellion of man. And so City Church, I want to prophesy to you. God is calling each and every one, not the guy at the front. Each and every one, including the guy at the front. To step up in the authority of the Son. So that when you see something that is corrupt, that you can call and author it to the way that it should be. When you see sickness, you can say, that is not what my father did. Everything my father created was good. And I call it back into alignment. When you see financial lack, to not accept it as a slave and go, well, I can't do anything about this. I'm just a little orphan. Woe is me. And then get really good with your poetry about how bad it is. But author a new chapter where God is empowering you to write a new story about that situation. That when that little weird idea comes into your brain, that business idea may be revolutionary on the planet to empower you to overcome that issue. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. I thank you for moments in time where you will highlight and enlighten people's hearts to brand new realms of possibilities and that you will empower us to step into those. But I also thank you for dreams when we're sleeping before that moment comes so you would prepare us for it. I thank you for that divine confidence that we would step up into, that sometimes we would have no idea what's coming out of our mouth and we'd be prophe prophesying live. But other times you would have given us a prophecy that we've sat on for two years. I thank you for the color and variation in your kingdom. And I thank you for that authorization for your poets to write new chapters on the earth. And right now, as sons of God, I just want to bless Hong Kong. I want to prophesy prosperity. I want to prophesy freedom. I want to prophesy more grace and favor over the city. I know people have been reeling financially and economically, and there has been such fear in the city. And as a son, we, we corporately prophesy the favor of God on Hong Kong. Father, we thank you that you have loved Hong Kong. Father, we thank you that even though things might have been difficult for a time, your favor was never withdrawn from this beautiful place. And we continue to agree with heaven that you have blessed the gateway city of Hong Kong. Father, we thank you for China. And we pray that there is an increased blessing on China and a favor to overcome whatever difficulties China is facing. We pray for every COVID patient in China right now, that they would feel an empowerment and a favor to overcome that sickness. Thank Thank you, Father, for your grace. If there's ever a place that needed grace, it was China. Thank you for your, father, for your grace, Father. Thank you. We just command that. We command that. We command that. And Father, in your kingdom, we know your greatest desire is to see the, the, the rebellious children of the world coming into the light of your kingdom. And so the greatest prayer we can pray is to agree that we want to display your glory to those people who need you most. And we pray for such a drawing in that, that when the sun was lifted up, people were drawn to him. We pray for City Church to be lifted up so that those who do not, know, do not yet know you, Father, would get to know you. We pray for such an ease and such a flow that even through persecution, ears would be opened and eyes would be opened to the gospel. That people would not be blinded to the gospel of this beautiful son of yours, Father. We thank you for that. I can just, I, I can see, I don't know if it's next month or next year, or I don't know the time frame, but I can see people getting saved in droves in Hong Kong.
And I don't know if it's street evangelism. I don't know if it's church service. I don't know what it is. I can see people getting saved. And I just want to agree. Every one of us, just agree. Say, Father, thank you. Thank you for people getting saved. Thank you for your beautiful salvation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.